Great. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so Matthew, we're, we're really happy you're joining us this morning and, and we get to chat to you about, uh, about Paul and Enrici and, and the story behind uh, Ricci and, and understanding more about uh, what, what's happening uh, with your team uh, as, as we go through our own process on, on our side. So, uh, you know, we have some of the team here, uh, but um, a circuit launch collab is, a, is an educational program uh, that, that we've been running here, uh, which is sort of radical take on education where we put uh, projects uh, in, in the focus, in the spotlight, and we have students actually work through real life project while they're learning uh, skill set and, um, and uh, you know, rolling up their sleeves and, and getting some, some true experience. And uh, it's been really a great experience for us. Uh, we, you know, we're in week 11 of our 12 week program. And of course we've been building Ricci for this program uh, and it, it's provided an incredible educational experience for them. And, uh, you know, across our program, we have 12 students working uh, across uh, three countries and, and four time zones. And we also have about half the team remote. So for us, it's also been a great experience on how you have remote collaboration across uh, a complex project like Ricci. Uh, and, you know, you can see Ricci, Ricci is coming behind. Uh, you can see Ricci behind Dan there is really coming together. And just in the last week or so, we've actually started to fire it up and, and start experimenting with small movements across the actuators. And, you know, in the last, in the last little bit of our program here, we're going to be starting up some of the applications and it's getting very exciting for us. Uh, so this is a great time to speak with you uh, and, and get a little more insight behind the scenes. Uh, so maybe just to kick us off here, um, maybe we could just hear you introduce uh, your story personally and, and how Pollen came to be. Okay, yeah. So. Uh, I'm uh, Mathieu Lapel. Uh, I'm a French guy. Um, I'm in robotics since 10 years. I did a PhD in a lab uh, in France. Uh, during my PhD, I did, I did uh, the Poppy robots. It's uh, another open source humanoid robot. It was maybe the first one being fully open source and fully printed. And in this, uh, yeah, during my PhD, I, I met uh, Pierre, which is my co-founder at Polen. And we have actually worked a lot together on Poppy for uh, four years at, at least. And then we decided to start uh, a company to, to have more freedom to create uh, the robot, robot and technology as we want. And we started Pollen in 2016. Oh, that's with, great. Uh, yeah, with uh, mostly the idea to just push on the daily life techno we were building in our labs without <laughs> no more business idea than that, just doing great things with uh, robots and AI. And actually pretty fast, uh, people has asked us to build a bigger poppy, <laughs> so a bigger arm poppy, and this uh, is how Richie has begun, just being a, a, a poppy but <coughs> longer arm, able mm -hmm. to grasp object. And we just uh, work, worked on this prototype for several years until we found out that Maybe there is something more important to do with this robot. And so we just switched from doing Richie and other things to doing only Richie. Okay. And yeah, and we started to build a, a crank and the head for the robot and starting to explore how we can develop application on top of that and so on. And finally, we unveiled the robot at CES uh, 2020. Right. Yeah. So Ricci, yeah, that, that was one thing that was exciting for us is that, you know, we were, we were seeing Ricci uh, effectively come on the scene uh, as, as a really a, almost a brand new platform uh, that, that we could play with. Um, so that's really interesting to hear that the, the origin story of Ricci was uh, in, in some part was inspired by feedback from your first project. 
maybe you could let us know the types of folks that were that were providing that feedback to you. Like, were there, were there specific people in industry? Was this an education? And and why do you think that that was their request to have something that looks more like Ricci? Uh, well, doing Poppy, we actually there is actually maybe 100 Poppy in the world. And it wasn't expected at the beginning of the project, but just a research project. We did, we did it a bit more. Uh, we designed it, designed this project a bit more uh, to, to go beyond beyond our research lab to become a platform for other research lab, but maybe one or two actually take off only organically. We just didn't. Uh, of marketing about it. And doing that, we saw need in education, of course. A lot of uh, people in education using Poppy in research and in healthcare. And actually, it's people in research on healthcare that ask us to build a bigger Richie to actually explore how robots like this can help people with disability. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's research healthcare. That's the, uh, which was the first initiation for, for Richie. Very cool. Okay, that's great. So um, another, th another aspect of Richie, which is really fascinating to us is uh, part of the robotic architecture that uh, you've also pioneered, which is the Luo system, uh, or uh, actually, we're, I'm not sure how you are you pronouncing Luos. Um, yeah. yeah, Luos. Okay, and uh, lots of interesting things there. Maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, how Luos came to be as well. Okay, so Luos was also a project we started in our research lab uh, about the same. A bit after Poppy, actually, uh, because with Poppy we had difficulties to let people modify the robot and add new things. Just the robot was being as we designed it at the beginning, and it was hard to, to make it evolve for non-expert people. And we wanted to have a more modular electronics, so they can just add something on, to, on the top. And back then, there was not so much uh, modular frameworks to do that. And we started to, to think how we can create a communication bus to let different kind of device talk on the same, uh, on the same communication bus and really made for robotics. And this was the initial idea. And so we continue to work on that uh, at the beginning of Poland. And we developed some first prototype. Uh, but then when we switched to Richie only, we just, we split uh, the activities in two companies. And one became uh, Luos, uh, the Luos company, which is, uh, the CEO is uh, Nicola one of the ex co founder of Poland. And Pierre and I, we continue the working on Richie. So now Lios is more, uh, is really a, a, a project of uh, Nicolas. And we use it at Poland, but we are not uh, involved more than that to, to make it happen. So. Okay. Okay. Um, that's super interesting to hear. So it's sort of this or organic uh, need that you that you discovered through that initial development. Um, you know, uh, many of our students are are excited about Luos and and you know it, how it's addressing one of the one of the core challenges in, in robotics, which is uh, you know overcoming sort of the, the system architecture and and the complexities around setting that up, especially when you have multiple embedded systems. Uh, could you share with us a little bit about um, how you see Luos 
hope in the future and maybe it improves. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I lose the connection for a while. I see it looks the, like yeah, it looks like Andrew is uh just, just is Andrew. In, is uh still there for a second. Just give him a sec. Poor Andrew also had a situation last week where uh, we're in the middle of a Zoom call and uh, the battery on his laptop uh, yeah. started swelling <laughs> and uh, it completely dropped off. It's like, no, that laptop is toast. <laughs> um. Yeah, so he's just ducked off, so I'm sure he'll be back in a second. But if you, Mathieu, if you wanted to continue talking about the, the Lewis question, that would be wonderful. Well, I didn't understand the end of the question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, but maybe, uh, maybe I can invite uh, Nicolas. I will try to. Oh yeah, that would be oh. wonderful. Um, there we go. Can I have someone? Or can oh, there you go. Um, Andrew, um, we're just also going to invite Nicolas onto the to the call to talk a bit. Oh, more perfect. About oh, that would be great. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. I, I dropped off the Zoom, Zoom like shut down and started up again on me. I'm not sure what was happening there. Let me get any warnings. Um, where? That was just that last question where you started to break up. Oh, yeah. sure. Um, well, if if he's going to be joining us, maybe I'll maybe I'll come back to Lewis as a subject um, later. Uh, so speaking speaking more oh, can you guys hear me still yeah okay Just, great uh, yeah I, I got the answer from nicolas uh, right now so i think he will come uh, soon okay okay uh that'll be great to hear as well um so um for for ricci specifically um could you take us through sort of the the development process uh what that looked like for your team uh, from from you know when you had this idea that you needed to create a, a more scaled up poppy that that's able to grasping um, through to when you had a, a prototype advanced enough to start experimenting with customers like how, what what was the team like during that time how long did that last what were some of the challenges you encountered uh, during that development process uh, we were mostly two or three people working on Richie most of the time until uh, CES uh, unveiled. Um, and we have a really organic way of development. <laughs> okay. So it's, yeah, we, we really, we don't have a roadmap um, and it's really based on the client need and custom and uh, user needs. And they actually show us where we should push the robot. And it's really like uh, a, a really fast iteration between the needs and what we can do. And then we improve the robot a bit and then new customer arrive with new needs. And then among the new needs, we, we see one or two we can prototype a new solution in just really quickly and we do it and then we and, and so on and so on and yeah it's really emergent and organic really hard to to explain it uh, because uh, it just happened like <laughs> like that uh, we don't have a, a really a, 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 a static one map yeah, we just have skills and, mm -hmm. um, and we like to build new things. <laughs> and we just speaking with people, we we know what to build next. Um, yeah, and so on and so on. Very cool. Um, until it works. <laughs> right, right. That's great. So a very it's, it's a very sort of experimental iterative approach that you're taking. Yeah, we we saw so many startup in robotics fails because they just 
raise a lot of money, build a robot they, des they, they, they decide to do one day and do industry industrialization and so on and so on and ship and already build the 10,000 units for the first batch. And then if it just it's a good robot, but maybe it missed one feature or it missed something and it would be easily fixable if it just to try before and iterate on the design before and so mm -hmm. we we don't have this kind of uh, process so really it's the, it's the opposite um and so it's why also why uh which he evolved so much and during your your 12 weeks uh, some component has changed and was maybe a mess for you to update the robot but uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> the problem of having a robot that evolve uh, continuously. Yep, yep, absolutely. So, so it's almost, you know, more more similar to how you might see software development, where you have this continuous improvement cycle, um, which it, which is interesting. You know, we're seeing this, uh, you know, a, clearly an explosion in hardware and robotics development, uh, and and there seems to be sort of a new level of accessibility in, in, in development there. Um, uh, because we're seeing, you know, Ricci is a great example. We're seeing lots of robots um, across the community now. Um, do you think, uh, do you think this is a particularly ripe time for robotics or why, why do you think we're seeing sort of this explosion in robotics development now? Uh, fully preaching it is a really Changing the, the way we can design robots, mm -hmm. just can prototype in a, in a few minutes uh, and test and test and test. Uh, last new new um, new thing in AI are really changing the, the domain completely. Uh, when I when I started uh, working on robotics ten years ago. Vision was a mess. It was complicated to just recognize people and well in in, in any condition. And now it's just a problem solved. Uh, it can be easily embedded in uh, in a robot. Uh, so yeah, all this recent progress in AI are really helpful for building robots. Mm -hmm. The fully printing is really full, and it's we are starting to have a better battery. We are starting to have better sensor mm -hmm. lidar, which it became a bit less expensive. And yeah, it's it's exponential. Exponential. <laughs> I mean, uh, everything is is becoming is uh, become, becoming better and better, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we are really at the edge of having all you need to build a robot, all the hardware and software, and all the technology to, to have a, a robot uh, moving around. Raspberry IP also has made a lot of, uh, has really simplified the, the development of robots. Uh, yeah, it's really a combination of different contribution from different topics coming together uh, right now and and yeah I think it's yeah a, definitely a, it's definitely sort of a um a self self-feeding uh a positive feedback loop in the ecosystem where you have all these components one of the one of the interesting aspects for our class or um the variety of sensors on Ricci and the potential for new sensors so one, one of the questions our students uh um I uh, was curious to hear your thoughts on our, you know, Reach has this really interesting sound system, but also this computer vision system. Um, how, how do you, how, how do you see sort of the combination of the combinations of these sensors enabling um, new applications? Uh, and do you see sort of other sensors coming into the sensor suite on Reach to, to push that even, even further? Yeah, you mean the, yeah, so the sound system, you mean the microphone and the speaker. So mm -hmm. yeah, so that uh, obviously is made mostly for interaction with people. 
So in order to uh, create sound to explain what the robot is doing, or text to text to speech to create interaction with people, and the microphone is made to understand uh, for speech recognition. Uh, Unfortunately, we didn't find time yet to work a lot on, on this aspect, but the hardware is here, so just a software update for, for the future. Um, and the vision, the vision is really a, a big a big aspect. Uh, so right now on the current version, we have two cameras with different wide, different uh, angles, so one is really wide to see the scene and detect people, for example. And one is more focused on the task. So the robot can maybe have a better vision of what he's doing. Uh, and we have um, a tensor processor unit, unit the coral, uh, inside the robot to mm -hmm. embedded vision uh, Embedded recognition or detection. So, with all of that, we we have the good hardware to to do uh, visual servoing or recognition. We are working on a new update uh, for the vision because it, it was good, but not as good as we <laughs> wanted at the yeah. <laughs> And so now we will have uh, two camera with um, and motorized zoom. So you can change what the robot see. Oh, wow. Focus or you can go wide. And two camera that can see the same thing. So we can, it open for stereo vision. Mm. So both in a wide angle or short, uh, short angle. And what we are doing right now with that is teleoperation. So we have, uh, you, you put your VR headset and you actually in the head of the, the robot and you can see what you can see. And with the stick, the joystick, you can control the, the robot to grab object. And yeah, this is, we are really close to have a, uh, really well working version and it would be released at the beginning of the next uh, year in general oh, amazing with uh, so this this new vision system and with tele operation so yeah with that uh, vision i think we, we will be able to do a lot of more a lot of interesting things that's super cool that's one of the that's one of the applications that our students were interested in in tackling in the future there's a lot of interest around this idea of of teleoperation and also uh, human robot interaction more broadly uh, this is very interesting so Ricci has been out there in, in the world for um, a, a few months now and, and we've seen really exciting photos from, uh, from you guys released of, of sort of an assembly line of Ricci's, uh, you know, getting, getting shipped to customers. Um, so at this point, we're, what, we're curious in um, which industries uh, you see Ricci making the largest impact. Um, and, and sort of what you see the, the use cases uh, for it are right there now that customers are starting to use it. Okay. Well, uh, as we see it right now, so an open source platform with, uh, well, not really an application, not application running on it, instead, instead of some uh, quick and dirty one we, we need to show. Uh, it's really a, a perfect uh, platform for research and education because yeah, all, all is already here and you can hack the robot and understand how it, how it works and adapt it to your setup, experimental setup and so on. So as it, as it is right now, it's really well suited for researcher and education. 
what we are working on is more with uh, healthcare industry right now. Uh, again, because just um, we get a lot of clients in this industry asking for having robot to help them build the assistance for for uh, disabled people. And before the current crisis, <laughs> we had uh, some uh, uh, first uh, uh, prototype with uh, retailers and uh, ev uh, events. So events is really <laughs> a bit complicated. Yeah. Uh, right now. Uh, so we have few clients in this uh, in this industry, and yeah, normally it should have a lot of them <laughs> in this industry. Uh, yeah, currently it's a bit more complicated, but <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, that's a, we're we're living in a different world now, um, and you know, one of one of the things that we've seen during coronavirus is sort of a a, a surge in an interest in adopting uh, robots, especially with social distancing and and maybe not being able to access workplaces. Do you see Ricci playing a role there at yeah. all? Yeah, yeah, you can because now with this teleoperation, it's really like a Zoom, but you can move as well. So, mm -hmm. we, and again, it's, it was not in our roadmap uh, back in uh, CES 2020, but at least three or four people asked for having teleoperation, in particular for healthcare, because for healthcare, you need to. You can't have a prototype, actually, and you robotics is still really complicated. It's really hard to have a, a working application in any context, and it will, even if you are really good, you will have a failed failure. And being able to teleoperate the robot at distance is really uh, important, just to to take the control if something uh, bad happen or if the task is too complicated for robotics right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine application where the robot can perform autonomously some simple task, and then you need something more complex and just you jump into the robot and do the task with your hand and by teleoperation and go back to doing uh, something else. Yeah. And this uh, yeah, a feature that some company are working on, on oh, sorry, that's application company are working on with Richie for assistance to disabled people at home. So they can have a Richie doing simple tasks such as uh, uh, giving uh, a glass of water but for something more complex or if uh, yeah for something more complex they provide the services to teleoperate the robot and it's not anymore required to have someone going to the house of the people so in yeah in this context uh, of we of everyone doing everything at distance uh, Robot with teleoperation can be a, a kind of new new zoom. <laughs> right, right. With advanced yeah. Uh, features. Yeah, definitely. And um, you know, it, it brings us into this new world where we're seeing more interaction with with robots like Ricci and 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 how important that human robot interaction is. Uh, one one of the things that. Uh, really attracted us to the Ricci project um, was was simply its aesthetic. It's, it's just its appearance. Uh, it has a really unique look. It's really sort of, a, uh, maybe you'd even call it cute, but it's it's definitely identifiable. Um, what was the inspiration for, for the aesthetics for Ricci? Yeah, again, it's hard to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because uh, it's really the, the convergence of a lot of, of idea we had for 10 years and building robot, uh, small robot, uh, some small prototype that uh, we didn't privilege. Just uh, for example, we had a prototype with a uh, robot with fabric as a body and we mm -hmm. 
and it find it's placed in a finally in Iguichi. And we, the, I think the most uh, specific aspect of Iguichi is the eyes, with this big one and the small one. And just uh, an experiment I made. Uh, I found an old camera in my uh, my house one day. I just take it on the side for future use. And one day we decide that uh, we, we wanted Richie to have a head. And I just tried to put this big uh, camera lens with a small, <laughs> a small webcam. Um, and just, yeah, it's an <laughs> emergence of, uh, <laughs> of that that give, uh, give us uh, the way to go with uh, Richie. And for the antenna, the moving antenna, just my dog giving me inspiration because he was moving his tails. And okay. <laughs> and I, when I, one day, <laughs> I, I, I saw it doing, moving his cell, it, it, <clears throat> its tail, uh, and I just find it really uh, convenient to convey emotion with while keeping the the air a fix, so you can keep the eyes not moving, so you don't have to move the, the head, but you can show excitation. And so this gives uh, the idea to put a moving antenna behind the robot. And yeah, just uh, this process of adding block by block. And at the end, at the end, the emergence of uh, the design of uh, Richie. And of course, in Richie, there is a lot of copy. Uh, so in the design of the arm and uh, the overall design, I think we can see the, at the same people behind. So there is, uh, we like to do lightweight robots. And, Try to keep it as simple as possible. That makes and sense. And it's a really interesting the design aspect too. It is simple, but it's so emotive at the same time. Um, I just wanted to also mention, Andrew, uh, Nicholas from Luos has joined us a few moments ago. Uh, so he's now on the call and happy to answer. Yeah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so you if you have any questions about Luos, I'm here to, to reply to it. So I don't know if you, if you perhaps I'll just uh, introduce myself. So my name is Nicolas, and I worked with uh, Mathieu at uh, at uh, at uh, Pollen uh, for some years, and uh, before that uh, uh, on, at Inria when uh, when we were in the research lab, uh, working on on Poppy. So we we worked together a few during few years, and uh, and now uh, after after the the the, the the passage at uh, Inria together. We, we, we found uh, Poland Robotics together and um, we developed some modular technologies uh, called LUOS. And, um, and a few, two years from two years now, uh, we have created a second company uh, dedicated to only uh, the modular part, which is LUOS. So now I'm managing the, the LUOS company, uh, which is a spin off of, uh, of, uh, of Poland. So basically, uh, Richie uh, has been designed based, based on, the, on the LUOS technology, which is um, a modular technology uh, trying to reproduce the, the, the microservices philosophy into the embedded world. So basically, the idea is to separate the software features uh, from the hardware um, based on this kind of, uh, of uh, project management of project development, uh, it's easy to, to, to reuse software development in a lot of different kinds of projects. And um, this way, we want to uh, uh, disrupt uh, the way embedded, world, uh, embedded product uh, are designed uh, in the world today and allow people to, to, to really easily create product, complex product with uh, multiple boards on the system and allow them to develop uh, a product with a lot of different boards the same way that they could uh, develop it uh, using only one board. So the idea of Luos is to create different kinds of features 
on any features can access any other features of the of the machine uh, anywhere on the robot so like if all the features are on the same board without on the developer uh, don't have to to know uh, the motor is, is uh, at the at the id uh, for something like something like that so basically it's just like how to create services and share it to an entire ma machine so i don't know if you have any particular questions about uh, this kind of technology but uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, our 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 class has been specifically interested in in um, you know one of the one of the biggest challenges Lewis is 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 solving, which is this idea of modularity in robotics, right? And and easing the development, especially around embedded systems. Uh, and um, you know one one of the things that our our team is really interested in is is sort of the the future of, of Lewis and 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 where you see. You know, from t from today, where you see it going? What what can we expect uh, from from it in the future? And how do you how do you see it evolving to to sort of fit that need? Yeah, um, basically, our our idea is to completely change the way people develop embedded systems. So we think, as the web uh, was doing a few years ago, we think the embedded world will evolve the same way, and 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 uh, and the the the, the people developing embedded systems gonna use uh, this kind of way of thinking, which is microservices. And this kind of approach is uh, for now really difficult to, to have in embedded world because there is no technology allowing to, to make it easy. But uh, we see some companies start uh, starting uh, uh, developing uh, mass product uh, like, like, like that, for example, products for, from Samsung or Dyson and the, those big companies start developing their, their, their product using this kind of philosophy and historically when uh, Dyson for example developed uh, a, 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 a robot vacuum cleaner, cleaner they develop one board per product and if they have uh, 10 different kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, robots uh, they develop a specific board for each of them. And now they start developing boards per features. For example, they have a board for motors, a board for sensors, a board for Wi-Fi, and they can reuse those boards to develop the new products. And those new products, they, they can produce this new product in few months, basically. Uh, and, uh, and the production costs is quite the same because all of those boards are produced with um, uh, in a lot of more uh, uh, iteration because um, a lot, of, a lot more because this bo those boards are, are used on different uh, products and you, they can reuse it uh, really mm -hmm. easily. Mm -hmm. So actually, we we just see the market evolving about that, and um, there is a, a, a every day more and more uh, uh, users and people uh, thinking about this kind of uh, of things. And at US, we called it microservices for embedded system, but the real name is cyber physical systems, which is the research, research name uh, of what we are doing. And we don't really like this name because it don't tell anything to anybody, but, yeah. <laughs> but we, we like uh, the microservices because it's a market already known by, by, by a lot of engineers. And mm -hmm. the idea is exactly the same. And we just want to be able to share a, a development we made in, on the embedded world and share it to other people and, and uh, enable other people to, to just use it without having to read a big manual and learn how to develop a new board to make the glue between two different kinds of systems. And our dream in, is in the future, we want people that develop machines to be able to just buy, for example, a motor on a sensor and just plug them together on, and then it works. They they don't gonna have to develop a board to link a motor and the sensor. The idea is to make it work together, uh, uh, straightforward. Yeah, very very cool. Uh, one a, another question that we had on the team uh, was around the the relationship between the hardware and the software. Do you view the Luo system as something that's hardware agnostic? With with the dream in the future, be able to run it on 
different hardware systems or do you view that uh, the hardware is something that, that the, the architecture and the hardware you've developed so far is something that's integral to the, to the yeah. Uh, product? Yeah, our dream is to have something completely ag agnostic to, to the hardware. Uh, and uh, we, for now, we, we principally, uh, uh, major, I don't know how to say it, but uh, we, we support uh, 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 ST, STM32 uh, uh, processor, which is mm -hmm. the first one uh, we, we work with. And now we start working with other uh, um, uh, chips that allow people to, to use Luos on a lot of more uh, possibilities. And also we work to, to be able to use a different kind of network on the machine. For now, uh, Luos is uh, particularly, particularly developed for uh, RS-485, but we start having some customers using a different kind of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of communication protocols on the, on the hardware uh, bus. And uh, indeed, the idea is to have to allow people to develop their own hardware and Leos is just the software uh, allowing them to create some features and to declare those features to, to the entire system. So we work to, uh, uh, to be completely agnostic to the hardware. Very cool. Yeah, and of course that would open up to even greater development, right? If, if you can start putting it on all, all types of hardware, uh, you can open up the community pretty dramatically. Um, and, and, you know, just the, the open source nature of the project, uh, you know, makes it, um, uh, will make developers sort of more, more curious, more, more willing to, to put their time into yeah, using yeah. it. As and a that's why it's open platform. source. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and, and that would be another great thing that, that we'd love to hear. You know, both Ricci and Luos are, uh, have this open source philosophy um, why, and, 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 you know, you're, you, we, we've seen interesting, uh, you guys have written about it on, on your blog or, around that, uh, maybe you could, uh, uh, sort of go into that a little bit further and, and, and describe why, why you believe the open source, um, framework for, for both projects is so important and, and why you see that being such a, such a boost to the community. Yeah. Uh, Mathieu, you want to, to start or, uh, or I do it? I know, I will start. Uh, okay. Well, uh, we do open source since, uh, <laughs> since a while. Um, it's both uh, because we think it's the most rational way to, to develop the robot, uh, because we ourselves don't like. Uh, to use a uh, non-open source uh, tool anymore. And I guess for other people to use robots, it's the same. They just want to have an open source robot and not having to deal with uh, a weirdly proprietary uh, software which uh, has uh, a field clause and you don't really know why. Um, uh, and we use open source a lot for everything, for the vision, the machine learning is open source, the programming language is open source, everything we use is open source. So it just makes sense to add a contribution to this global humanity effort to create uh, technology acknowledge uh, accessible to all. Um, so yeah, it's both the philosophical so we, we like the idea to just build a uh, technology that can be used by everyone freely and rationally because actually people ask us to have the, the robot open, open source. So a client require to have a robot open source. So hopefully for us, we have a, a good fit between our market and our philosophy. Mm -hmm. so it's great. Uh, and we just can go naturally and every, every time we, we do something we, we put it open source and we don't have to ask ourselves a lot of questions about uh, uh, IP and so on. Really uh, convenient to, to work with uh, this uh, philosophy. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, 
And you know, as, as the tools start to be adopted by the community, uh, do you see any, are, are there any challenges in, in going the open source route or, or have there been any surprises in, in, in having this open source development that you've had to adapt to or, or to overcome? Uh, well, uh, it's not easy to do uh, an open source project <laughs> uh, because you have a lot of people using it and not so much uh, doing contribution, but that's, uh, yeah, that's the rule. So you have sometimes a bit more support and you have to support people uh, doing great things, but you don't get uh, money out of it. And sometimes it's difficult to, to, go in a to go in the company and just have the time to spend for people uh, doing great things. Um, but without um, money out of it. Um, but it's necessary because these people are the creative one and you, you also need to have people involved, uh, actually paying by being involved. <laughs> and uh, it's really uh, great to have more people uh, doing things with our technology. It's really hard also to keep documentation and keep everything uh, up to date so people can use it without our guidance. So mm -hmm. that's really hard. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we, spend, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time with Poppy uh, just managing the project. That makes sense. Yeah, but the outcome uh, is really great. We are always so happy when we find a, a guy doing crazy thing with our technology and we didn't heard about we just didn't ask for the permission we just just did it mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. the, the final result it's always mm -hmm. a joy to to see that our work has been useful for one for, for people somewhere yeah that makes sense um and you know one one of the other uh, probably the, one of the largest successes in, in uh, open source and robotics has been uh, ROS, the robot operating system. And uh, we, we've seen some, uh, some hints of the connection between Ricci and, and ROS. Uh, how do you, what, what should we expect from that in the future? How, how do you view the relationship between Ricci and, and, and ROS and, and Luos and ROS for, for that matter? Uh, so, we didn't use the ROS one uh, because we find it a bit too, too complex to, to make it uh, works uh, for non-expert people. And we seek for simplicity in robots. And for most of the usage, we didn't need to have such uh, powerful tools as ROS. And most of the time, just a simple uh, Python IP was uh, enough so it was we it, what we did is it's what we did uh, for poppy and uh, witchy until now but now there is a ROS 2 uh, close to be uh, uh, finished at least uh, it's finished but being more adopted and so we are again with the new version of uh, witchy coming uh, in, the, in january we will be uh, a big software release where uh, Richie run on top of ROS 2. So ROS 2 will, ROS will be the, the, the really the backend of uh, Richie software for the next release. Wow. Uh, so yeah, so Richie will be ROS based robot. And we switched to finally switch to ROS because now we need to explore more advanced application, and we need to have the open source community working on 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 Wichi. And there is already a lot of open source uh, uh, algorithm and technology available on ROS, so we we just. Uh, connect Wichi to this um, ecosystem. So it can be useful for the ecosystem to grow with Wichi and 
for us to have uh, the existing application with Ross working on, on widget. And for, for Ross and Rios, it's not really Ross versus Rios, it's not, it's more Ross and Rios. <laughs> not the same, Ross is more for the embedding and Ross is more on the software aspect. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Should, so should we expect uh, uh, a, a stronger connection there too, as well, sort of completing, completing the triangle? Between what? Between uh, 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 between uh, Ricci, Luos, and and Ross. So so Ross yeah. Ross and Ricci sounds like we're headed towards a strong relationship. And then does the same go for for Luos? Uh, maybe it's more to Nicolas to answer that. Yeah, maybe. yeah, of course. So basically, yeah, we are working on a bridge between Ross and Luos. And uh, we're working with the same guy uh, at, at uh, with uh, with Polen to to support the link between Ross and, and Luos. And for now, he's he's working uh, really good with Ross two, and we have to work to to make it work with uh, Ross one. Uh, but yeah, yeah, uh, we, we we work about uh, in this direction, and uh, we have some uh, other customers. Than uh, than the Polens that uh, that choose Ross on their on their products. So uh, um, also industrial products that uh, use start using Ross too. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, you know, we're we're definitely looking forward forward to some of those new releases. And you know, as 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 we see folks sort of pushing the application space for for Ricci and and for Luos, um, uh, where do you see? Uh, we, we talked a little bit about sensors, but uh, where would you see other um, areas for improvement on, on the Ricci platform? Um, I really like to have a LiDAR. LiDAR, yep. <laughs> uh, but until now, actually, I would like exactly the same one as uh, the one on the iPad Pro. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I I can't uh, get it uh, right now. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm really waiting for for getting uh, such a technology uh, on board with uh, Richie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really great help to analyze the world and detect more efficiently the where object are and how to drop them. Mm -hmm. so I'm mm -hmm. Find uh, that uh, soon. Um, other improvement in Richie are, are more in the um, grasping. So I'm working, uh, we are working on, we expect to work uh, during the next year on new motors to control the arm uh, because right now we are limiting, limited, limited by the, um, the, the power of dynamic cell. Mm -hmm. and yeah, hopefully uh, we, we can find a new, uh, we are looking for a, a new form of actuation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, to, yeah. That was one of the things we were noticing is the, um, the, the payload limitations with the Dynamixels mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, the class was definitely curious around from, from a uh, mechanical electrical aspect, um, what sort of actuators you would look to or, or sort of mechanical redesign that you would look to to increase that payload to open up the application space there? Well, we uh, really need to have way more powerful motors to go beyond and to have both precision, dynamics, and torque. And so, yeah, we just have to scale up the, the power of the, of the arm. Uh, I'm not sure the 500 grams limit is a problem because most of the time in services you don't move so some really heavy, uh, heavy object, but you really need to be more dynamic, more mm. high, and this require more power. So this is a, a way to improve the robot. And um, of course we are, thinking about mobility of the robot. So right now just a torso. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so this is also on the on the roadmap. Uh, so having a mobile base for so having Ricci on some sort of a, a mobile base. Yeah, I think it's necessary to have a robot able to move. Yeah, somehow in the in the future. We are we have started with a strong focus on manipulation because there is not so much robot doing that uh, on the market right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. especially a, a, a low cost manipulator. There, there's not too much out there, yeah. um, right? You have, you know, there's things like the shadow robot hand, which are highly dexterous, but cost, I think one of those is like 70, $80,000 US or something like that, which is like multiple, you get multiple reaches for that. Uh, and there's a handful, you know, Open Bionics is an interesting open source grasping uh, project, but there's there's really not too much out there. And obviously a really strong need to explore grasping in the robotics community. It's, just, it's, just, it's, it's also a, a really, you know, a ripe area of, of development. So that's very interesting as well. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're near the top of the hour here. Uh, I, I had one last question uh, for, for, for both of you. Uh, since, since our class uh, consists of you know, young, uh, you know, uh, young folks that are, are looking to, to get into the field of robotics and, and start their careers in this in exciting industry. Um, so they're looking for uh, recommendations on on how to get more involved, and uh, also uh, recommendations for resources that they can use uh, to to boost their development. Uh, whether that's um, connections into industry through events, or book rem recommendations, or courses, um, people to follow. Uh, they, they'd love to hear your advice on 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 that. Um. For my, in my case, I really learn by doing a lot. Uh, I think a good thing in robotics is to have a, a strong, uh, strong skill in at least one domain and start from that and expand to other uh, domains. So for my, my case was uh, doing uh, mechanics. Uh, I started building robots not doing, not knowing much in, in software and electronics, but just by doing and doing Arduino to learn electronics and and a lot of uh, for software is really easy to learn because you have so much uh, resources online. So yeah, there is a lot of things. I think the, yeah, the best way is to to learn by doing, and so your what you are doing, guys, is really great for 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 that. Uh, and there is, a, in addition to that, there is now um, Coursera, where you can find uh, some great um, courses about uh, AI, actually. Uh, I never tried uh, robotics, but uh, I actually learned AI with uh, Coursera, in addition to what we, we did uh, uh, in our research lab. So I can recommend to, to, to do some uh, learning in, in that. Uh, uh, what, uh, what else? Uh, there is some books also uh, from machine learning. I really like uh, the books from uh, Francois Cholet, uh, Deep Learning with Python, explaining how to use uh, Keras machine. Uh, sure more. If you are more in the, if you like to explore more research aspect, uh, one of the main resources I used for my PhD was uh, this. It's uh, a, a, a book hmm. for Wolf Pfeiffer. Uh, and it's really uh, important for us because we really think like, we can't solve important problem in, in AI without body. And when we design a solution or an application with Richie, we never think about solving it just by 
improving the software, but also by changing the hardware. It's also why it's a, it's a pretty, pretty printed and open source because open source hardware, because yeah, when you, you have a new task, sometimes it's really easy to just change <laughs> just a, a part of the end to, to make it uh, make it works rather than building a really complex uh, software architecture. And you have always to think with the robotics, you have always to think in all the dimensions, hardware, software, and AI, and user, uh, and also user, how people will react to the robot, mm -hmm. and about the robot. So, Yeah, it's really pluridisciplinary, uh, and the, the the best you can do when you you are learning is to be is to at least understand the problem of other uh, other domains when you to be able to work with your colleagues uh, efficiently. And the best way to do that is just to, to do what you are doing, okay? Just uh, have a group of people working, uh, trying to build a, a complex robot from scratch. Absolutely, absolutely. Great, yeah, I think they'll, they'll, they'll love hearing that, uh, especially since we're 11 weeks through building this. I think they could, uh, I, I hope they feel like they've learned a ton because they, they absolutely have. And, and, like you said, learning by doing is, is so effective, especially in this domain that has so many different complex components. Um, well, that that brings us, I, I, we, we're a little past the hour now, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll start to wrap things up here. Um, so Matthew and-, and uh, do, If we do have a few minutes, could we give uh, oh. Nick a chance as well to answer that question? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, if you guys have time. Uh, Nicholas, uh, do you do you have any uh, similar uh, question? Uh, just a advice for a class and and how to get more involved in this field and and what resources to look to? Yeah, um, for for my side, I, I'm more some a guy from embedded software and electronics. And as Matthew, uh, I learn uh, how to 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 develop machines on all of sort different sort of things by doing things uh, at home. So I start making robots at home when I, when, when, uh, when I was young. And um, after that, I, I, make, I, I made a lot of different kind of competitions, uh, robots competitions. So I learned a lot during this kind of events. And after that, with a lot of patients, I start working on the uh, robotics industry. Uh, I began to work at a company in France called Aldebaran, uh, now uh, uh, bought by, uh, by, by SoftBank. Um, and uh, from, from this moment, I never stopped working on robots. So basically, it just, it just do, for, you, you have to, to make robots to learn how to make them. So in fact, what we are, you are doing with, with, with Richie is extremely important and it's the best way from my, from my point of view to, to learn how to do it. Awesome, thanks, Nicholas. Uh, great, well, uh, let's see. Dan, Leah, do you have anything uh, that you wanted to add or, or ask uh, before we wrap up here? I just wanted to, to thank you guys for, for taking the time to talk to our, our community and being uh, you know so supportive of the open source uh, movement for hardware. We know that open source hardware is much harder than, uh, than open source software. And it's, uh, you know, we've just been really impressed by um, how much you, know, you guys have been willing to be able to help, at, help us and then um, and having the contribution. It's like that, that philosophy is something that, that we really love and then uh, pairing that with the uh, learning by doing of course there but we just wanted to to thank you guys in uh in so many ways for for both inspiring our team and uh and and it really holding up to those uh those principles of open source and uh and all of our our community is is very thankful for for that so uh we wouldn't obviously reach you wouldn't be here if it weren't for open source so it's, we appreciate it
Yeah, we're hugely grateful. Thank you so much. And uh, Dan, did you also want to share the news about uh, our next cohort and what we're going to be focusing on? Yeah, absolutely. So the uh, the next plan, uh, obviously, uh, we are going to be extending our, our relationship here with Ricci as a platform. It's such a wonderful, like you said, it's a as an educational uh, tool. It's so wonderful because we can be able to explore grants. So uh, our next uh, our next session will be um, actually exploring the the robot human interaction and using uh, Ricci as that platform. So we'll be uh, probably building a, a, a second arm. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you about getting another, uh, another set of Luo sports for the, uh, the other arm. And, uh, and then we'll be, uh, probably continuing our, our exploration with, uh, the orbit and neck for more, more, uh, you know, affectation and more, uh, development of, of, of emotion, which is Richie has been so good. And so we're really excited to explore that for our next session and invite people to, uh, to sign up for that coming up very, very soon. Um, and more information will be available on our, our website. The next section will be on with, uh, Richie. Is it actually Ro particularly robot human interaction. And it's that, that, you know, creating, uh, interesting, connections and, and the emotional response and communication and everything. So we'll see where, where that explores. So you guys have already given some really interesting, uh, you know, test platforms of kind of like the mass detection software and then playing tic-tac-toe. And uh, we're hoping to, to expand on that and go really into a little bit more of, uh, uh, you know, things like Simon Says and creating uh, fun, fun ways to, to interact. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we can probably wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Mathieu and Nicholas, for joining us in your, your Monday evening. And thank you, Andrew, for, um, for the Q&A, for be our master of ceremony. Mm -hmm. Thanks to all of our students for joining us, and uh, we'll hopefully see you all again soon. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Say bye to Richie. Say bye to Richie. <laughs> bye, everybody. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>